Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Father, you're the shepherd, shepherd your sheep.
Happy birthday to you. Oh, happy. It's Dylan's birthday. Oh, to you. Happy birthday, dear Dylan. Happy birthday to you. Speech, speech. Speech, make it long. I feel like I'm finished. I love you guys. Oh, you guys are the best. Especially Henry. <laughs> All right. I sense a hunger in here. I can feel the hunger. I can feel the hunger. Getting up eight o'clock in the morning to come here to hear the hear the word. I love that. It's powerful stuff right there. I feel that I feel that God, the Spirit, is feeling that. He's feeling it. Yeah. And He's saying, "Amen." Amen. I want to say thank. I want to first of all say thank you to June because sometimes I go through stuff. You know what I mean? Because the devil is a liar and he tries to make me feel like you know, am I really you know helping? You know, am I really doing what I should be doing? Am I saying what I should be saying? Am I really helping? Like in the jail ministry and even here as well, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm giving what's help, what's helpful and what's useful. And in and, and June, one of those moments when I was kind of like, kind of almost dragging my feet a little bit, June sends me a message, sends me a text saying, asking me about some stuff I was teaching in the class, asking me about how this one person kind of cut me off and I, I got distracted. Oh, I never yeah. got to go where I was going. I never got to finish. Oh. Dylan had a scripture. We never yeah. got to it. You know, I was going around the room with the scriptures. We never even got to that. Right. And she wanted to go, what, what am I missing? What, what did I not get? And I, I sent her what, where I was going, let her get the rest of it. And then she told me, she, she told me that what she gets in this class actually gives her an adrenaline rush, like for the rest of the week, you know, and I was like, amen. And just the fact that she's calling, asking me about what I was teaching on tells me she's getting it, you know, the powerful, big time. And then to add the fact that it's an adrenaline for her for the rest of the week. And I, I needed that. And you know, sometimes I need a little something like that because we, we don't hear a whole lot of feedback. Yeah. And, and just the fact that she's calling me, she has my text now, she has my number, she's texting me and asking, and I'm like, amen, thank you. You know, so uh, you have no idea what little bit of little something you might say might really give a, a, a little push. Yeah, a little push. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I appreciate that. Well, I, thank you. I, I thank you for the book you gave me, why God loves This one, isn't it powerful? Oh my gosh. I'm on the last everybody, chapter. Everybody should get this book. I mean, it's yeah, like... every Christian should have that book. Oh. I didn't want to bother you during the week. I'll ask you more questions. Yeah, yeah, you you too, buy too. Buy it. John does too. He calls me all the time asking me stuff. But no, I, I, I would like to give you your space, but if you're, you're right. open to right. that, I'll yeah. be asking you all over. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Well, it's good because she asked me to, what she wanted to ask what she was missing last because yeah. I was walking through the gray scriptures and that's what's so important because people try and it's, you know, like even last week we had, we had a lunch and I, and at the lunch, it's like I was sharing about grace and people tend to want to come back with something kind of combat grace, you know, like as if grace is taken away. They say, well, you're saying we have to do, we, you're saying we don't have to do this and we don't have to. He was saying, like I was saying, you don't have to do this and you don't have to do that. And he was saying, I'm saying, you're right. I, I am saying you don't have to do that stuff. But I want to. I'm, I, I'm, what the Holy Spirit does is actually motivates you to want to do this stuff. So, you know, and see, like they're trying to think. And, I, I, and, I, and it's, you know, I respect the fact that they're th kind of sometimes because you're from the outside looking in, you haven't really experienced grace and how it works. You're going to come off with that perspective, thinking that, you know, you're saying that we don't have to do stuff. And you don't, you know, that God is just going to smile on you anytime you sin. You know, it's like, you, you're sinning great. I love you anyway. You know, and it's like, but that's not the deal. His love captures your heart of want to please him. You don't want to sin. And, and it comes from a different motivation. You so, know what? Uh, let me tell you something along those lines that happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. So my sister's going through a real hard time with, the, with her family. And so she comes over and I ask her, I'm on her plan with the phone for the password to for technical support. She says, oh, I, I can't give you that because, of, you know, things get screwed up and everything. And I, my flesh reacted and said, 
Yeah, I just, you know, just don't trust. I, I just don't, can't deal with that. I don't like that. And I walked out. Yeah. And I'm walking down the street, and it, it, the, the Holy Spirit is saying, you know, you're wrong, right? You can't be doing this. Because she says, was that a godly thing? And so I walk back, and I Come say on. to her, listen. <laughs> I say, I love the Lord, but I live with my flesh. And my flesh reacted. Come on. So I'm really, really sorry. And so I started crying, and I did this beautiful prayer for her, and it really, it really just did a wonderful miracle thing. But that's the Holy Spirit working in you. Yeah. And see, that's so important. The Holy Spirit working in you is different from the Holy Spirit convicting you. The Holy Spirit told you, we don't roll like this. Yeah. That's not us. Yeah. You see what I mean? That's what the Holy Spirit does. And, 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 and people think the Holy Spirit is there to convict you and make you feel terrible about what you've done. But no, what the Holy Spirit does, we don't, you know, everybody has a conscience. Yeah. Okay, we all have that. Yeah. You know, you don't have to be a Christian to feel wrong about doing something. No. So is that the Holy Spirit, you know, working, you know, telling you, hey, you did. That doesn't, you don't need the Holy Spirit for that. I mean, you can feel terrible about doing something bad and want to correct it and fix it. You know, that's right. But the, what the Holy Spirit does is how do you handle that guilt? Yes. How do you deal with that guilt? Yes. You know, and like you motivate, he motivated you to get back in and do it yes. different. And yes. even to confess your fault and say, hey, I was wrong in that. Yes. You know, I apologize. I'm so sorry. And that's just not, that's not how I roll. That was that was my flesh. You and that, that's beautiful what you did. In my mind, what you did for your friend, even though you weren't, right? It's the same concept. And we'll remember, we're representing God yeah. as Christians. So right. we really need to step it up. And, understand, and when you understand, when people push your buttons like that, you're gonna, it's like it's a test. The, yes. devil is, the devil is tempting you, but God will use that temptation as a test. And, and through God, he will, he will turn that temptation, that testing, into a testimony. You when go. you do it, when you're led by the Holy Spirit and do it His way, he, you'll have something, to, like you shared that in here, because you did it God's way. You were led by the Holy Spirit to do right in the middle of the wrong. Yeah. You know, and God's Holy Spirit was able to shine through that crack. It doesn't mean there's no cracks. Right. It's just the Holy Spirit right. is able to shine through the cracks because the Holy Spirit is in you. Yeah. We're you all see? Yeah. Boxes, you know, we really are. Because we're not perfect. We're not perfect. No, I said no one's righteous with filthy dirty rags. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, We have to always remember that. But that's mm -hmm. great. Thank you for bringing that up, June and Henry, and how beautiful. See. I want to read something from you. I brought a few books. I'll read little somethings from these books. There's little some little nuggets. Okay. Um, it says uh, because grace, because we're talking about grace, right? This is a book called Captured by Grace. It's by David Jeremiah, same guy that wrote this book. He wrote this when it's called Captured by Grace. And what he does is he uses two people. He uses Paul and he uses John Newton. How many know John Newton who wrote Amazing Grace, yeah. how sweet the sound. Yeah. He, wrote that, yeah. that, he wrote that song, but he, he, he was originally, he was a, 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 a slave trade, a captain of a slave ship. And he used, to, he used to take slaves and take them in chains and half, half of them would die in, in, in the, in the, during the ride. Yeah. And, and it, that, was his that was his job and he did that. But then God captured his heart, and he actually went against the slave trade and actually fought against it. And, and, um, but, but God got a hold of him. But for but like 20 years, he was a Christian, and he was doing that as a slave trader, as a Christian. He was a Christian for years, but when God got a hold of him, when grace got a hold of him, you know, because you could be a Christian and not understand grace. Mm -hmm. you know, and, that, and, and back then, it was, he, was, he could do that because slave trading was legal. It, it wasn't against the law. Matter of fact, all through the Bible, it talks about you slaves... Listen to your masters. You masters, don't be rude to your slaves. Slave, slavery was a norm even in the Bible. You see, so it wasn't looked upon, it wasn't frowned upon. Okay, so, um, and he was comfortable with that, but then something got a hold of him with grace and said, this isn't right, we don't do this. this is, we're pulling these people away from their home and we're making slaves out of them and we whip them, we beat them, we treat them cold, coldly. You're right? And, and so all that changed, with, but, but this book, I want to read you something from this. Look at this. It says this. It says, um, it says, we find, okay, it says, and because grace cleanses us from sin, just as absolutely, we find ourselves standing at the throne of grace without any human ranks or measurements. All are, e get this, all are equally pure and clean before God. You and the Apostle Paul will stand together equally righteous in God's sight. Wow. The Father will look upon each of you and see only the purity of his Son. That's pretty good, huh? Yeah. 
You don't just stand as pure as Paul, stand before God right now and through eternity. You stand as pure as Jesus, standing before God right now. God sees you robed in his righteousness. That, that's pretty good. That's, that's pretty good. And you, you know why? Because the devil's pretty good at getting us to, to focus on our junk. But when you understand, well, that's what Jesus died for. He died to become sin for you so you could become the righteousness of God in him. So if you're in Christ, you're not in your sin. If you're not in Christ, you're in sin. So we need to see what that really means. Because he did not just die for your sins. He died to make you righteous. You see, so he didn't just forgive your sins. He actually makes you righteous. Now, to be righteous means I have right standing before God. And the devil wants to strip you of that armor. That's why it says to put on the armor of God. You need to wear that. Because the devil's going to accuse you of every sin that you've done. And make you feel very dirty and unworthy. And, and, and the point is, I am unworthy, but Christ made me worthy. You know, I am, I am pure, but I'm, I'm clothed in the purity of Christ. I am unrighteous, but he's, his righteousness is it's imputed unto me. You see, so it, it's all about Jesus. We, get, we make it about ourselves. And we get preoccupied with my failures and my weakness and my junk and my dirt. And, and the problem with that is that's your soul. Your mind is not perfect. And, you're, and because your mind isn't perfect, your body isn't going to always act perfectly. Right? Because it's your body, your soul, your mind, your thinking, your thought life. It, but what's pure and what's perfect before God, and God is spirit. The Bible says God is spirit. So those who worship it must worship in spirit. So that means how I approach God now as a new covenant believer, I approach him in the spirit of God that is in me now. The Holy Spirit manifested himself in me. And I'm one with him. The Bible says you're one with him in spirit, right? In spirit, you're one with Christ. So that's how I approach God. Okay? And, and, it, and, and what's a mystery is how in the world does it... Obviously, this is God's plan to save you by grace. For Jesus to pay for your sins. If that's God's plan, it must work. Right? Mm -hmm. So the question is, can I trust his plan? Can I, that's why it's all about believing now. That's why it's all having faith. I've got to trust that this plan of God to save me by grace and my faith in his grace is going to work to change me, to transform my life. I've got to trust it. Now, this is important because you've got to understand this. You know what everlasting life is? Yeah. It means it's never going to end. Yeah, right. Do you know, what it, ah, you know what eternal life is? There's a, there's a difference. Everlasting life means it's going to keep going forever. It never ends. Yeah. That's everlasting. Eternal life means no end, no beginning, and no end. That's Jesus. Jesus is eternal. You can read that about that in Colossians. He was eternal. He had no beginning, no end. He's the beginning, he's the last. He's Alpha and Omega. He was never, but in, he was there but in the creation. When God created everything, Jesus was there, the Bible says. The Bible says, in the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, the, Jesus was there. When God was creating everything, Jesus was there. He was eternal. And you are now, have, that's why it says, in him, you have eternal life. Because you are now eternal creature, not just no end. You had no beginning in Christ. You have you that's are an you, eternal that's heavy. That's heavy. being. Yeah. You are an eternal being. <laughs> I mean, because God lives outside of time, I can't remember with no beginning, no end. He lives outside of time, and we that's just stepped much, into yeah. that world. The Bible says you are seated with Him in heavenly places. You just stepped into that world of of, of eternity. Do you think that? <laughs> that's heavy, huh? It's too heavy. Huh? <laughs> Is it too heavy? It's not too heavy. No. It's just heavy. Heavy. I mean, I mean, that's what you need to understand. <laughs> that's what you gotta get. You're not, you're not, you're in the spirit. You're, you're, you're already seated with him. You're there already. <laughs> How? Before I came out of my mother's womb, that I was before. Well, listen, this is important. I'm glad you just landed on this. This is so important. Okay. <laughs> it's so tough. What did you do? How many sins did you have to commit to become a sinner? No. Well, hold on. None. Huh? None. Yeah. Zero. Now, both are true, but listen, actually zero, nothing, because you're born a sinner. You didn't oh, do yeah. what? You right. didn't do a single sin. That's Adam good. sinned for you. That's good. Yeah. Isn't that good? But yeah. in yeah. one yeah. sense, you're you're right that it did take one sin. It just wasn't yours. Right. It was Adam's. So it does take one sin, but not yours. Right. It right. was Adam's one sin that made you a sinner. Wow. So how many sins do you have to commit to make to become a sinner? None. Yeah. But how many sins does it take to become a sinner? One, Adam's. Yes. See, so you're born in this world without ever having ever committed a single sin. You're born a sinner. You're born with that sin nature. Yes. That's what the Bible says. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of, of spirit is spirit. So he's drawing a distinction between what is of the flesh and what is of the spirit. He says, in order, you, you, he says unless you're born of the spirit, you're not even going to get in the kingdom of God. He said that, right? 
Right, so here's the thing. Okay, so if you didn't have to commit, you didn't commit a single sin to become a sinner. But the Bible says when you become born again, how many righteous deeds do you, have to, do you, do you, do you need to make, to commit? How many, how many righteous deeds do you need to do? None. How many? None. To become righteous. If you're born again of the Spirit. Mm. None. Right. Huh. Because of Jesus. It's Him. It's his righteousness. It's not mine. And that's the problem people have. They're still imputing their righteousness to themselves. When the Bible says his righteousness is imputed unto us. Amen. And when you impute your, impute your own righteousness, of course you're going to feel dirty and rejected and think God doesn't want to talk to you. Especially when you have sermons telling you that God won't fellowship with a sinner. You've got to confess every sin, otherwise God won't fellowship with you. And that's what they say. That's what they say. And, and then you're putting it back on me and you're turning confession into another form of sacrifice, something I have to do to get right with God. Hello is what Jesus did to make me right with God. It's not what I do. Even in the Old Testament, they had to make sacrifices to kill animals to get right with God. That's what did it. It wasn't their performance. It was never their, how good they are. None of them were good. The Bible says no one is righteous. No one is good. Yeah. Nobody. Yes. We all fall short of the glory of God. So no, none of our actions is going to make me right with God. Well. So lose the thought. Hello. So if I want to know God is smiling on me, I better know it's all because of Jesus. Jesus makes God smile on me. It's what he did. It's not what I do. It's his, his obedience makes us righteous, not ours. Oh. So two questions. So was I, before I came out of my mom's womb, did I sin? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay, here's a way that you pray in the flesh. Oh, Father, I'm so unworthy. I'm so unworthy. I'm, oh, Father, I'm so sorry. Please, can you forgive me? Please forgive me of this sin. That's the flesh. Now, to pray in the spirit, thank you that that sin is covered in the blood. Thank you, Father God. I'm sorry that I, I'm, I'm having trouble with this area. Father God, I need help. Father God, but thank you that, you're, thank you that the blood is, keeps me standing holy and righteous before you, Father. Thank you that it's the blood that cleanses me of all my sin. Thank you, Jesus. That's coming to God in the Spirit because you're, you're acknowledging the cross. You never want to come to God without acknowledging the cross. Act as if it never happened. Act as if Je Jesus does, has no part to play in this. He is the part. He is why I can approach God at all. Because if I approach God in my sin, dude, no fellowship. But if I approach God in the Spirit of Christ, but there's your fellowship. That's how I come. There you go. So that answers that. What yeah. About, what about, was I created before I came out of the womb? Was I in spirit with God before I came out of the womb? No, but you were in Christ. You're in Christ. Uh, you stepped into the eternal when the yeah. Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Anybody who believes on him won't perish but have eternal life. So your eternal life comes through your relation to Jesus. So that, that, that was, you were not, uh, you being an eternal being be before you came in here, you were formed in the womb. God formed, he says, he says you knew me when I, was, when I was formed in the womb, you were there. So you were formed in the womb, okay. you, who you are. Right. Okay, that, that, created your personality, your, you know, your temperament, right? right? Mm -hmm. As far as you being there before that, the Bible doesn't, doesn't say anything toward that, does it? Anything about being there before? No, we're definitely yeah. not. We were created, yeah. created. We have a beginning. It, it we have a beginning. It never says anything. We, yeah, only Jesus had no beginning. Right. We do. Right. Well, we're in Christ. Yeah, we're, we're creatures created by God. We had a beginning. Jesus didn't. Right. Only God has no beginning. Yeah. Right. But in Christ, when we step into Christ, we step into eternal life. We step into a, a place where there is no beginning. We stepped into, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, on J and James um, uh, 6, 10, it talks about the whole armor of God, right? Mm -hmm. To fill ourselves with the whole armor of God. Ephesians. Ephesians. Uh, and then yeah. it says, praying always with the spirit. Uh, Paying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit and watching there on perseverance and supplication for all saints. Um, so when we take the whole armor of God, then we can be able to pray in the Spirit? No, I'm just asking. Because if if you understand what the armor of God is, it's, it's, the armor of God 
is it's your. The, the, in another place, it says to put on Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's what the armor of God is. The armor of God is putting on Christ. The Bible says all those who are baptized by the Holy Spirit have put on Christ. Mm -hmm. We put him on, and that's your righteousness. I'm robed with the righteousness of Christ, and that's how I approach God. Mm -hmm. So, but that spiritual armor, what it's talking about is the devil is going to attack that spiritual aspect mm -hmm. and help try and make you think you're not in the spirit, that God is still mad at you, that he doesn't love you. He's going to accuse you of sins that have been forgiven. Mm -hmm. He's going to come at you in that area, and that's why you need to put on Christ. When the devil is coming at you, accusing you, making you feel dirty and unworthy and feeling like, I can't even approach God. He doesn't want to fellowship with me. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Saying that God does not want to... Want to uh, the prodigal son came home and the father ran to that boy. God is all about so fellowship. We have to hold down to what he gave us. Ha, yeah, we, uh, basically, you've got to identify yourself with Christ. And, it's and my then, identity. And, and that's how you stand up against the devil. What did the devil do in the garden? When, listen, because this is important. What did the devil do in the garden with Adam and Eve? What do you tell them? He said, uh, uh, the, with, with Eve, he said, he, he said, um, uh, well, really he said, he, he, he tempted her to eat from that tree. And she says, he says, oh, did God really say not to eat from that tree? And she says, oh, we can eat from any tree in the garden, just not that one. He says, oh, God knows when you eat from that tree, you'll be like God. The, the Bible says that they were already created in God's image. He says he created a man and woman in his own image. So they were already as much like God as they needed to be. And here's Satan saying, oh, he knows if you eat from that tree, you'll be like God. See, he's attacking their identity. Mm -hmm. They're already like God. And he's saying you're not. Right. Okay? What do you do with Jesus in, in the temp three temptations? He said, if, if you're, the, you're the, son. the son of God, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. You see, that's what Satan does. He's at, after your identity. He's trying to get you to doubt who you are. Right. right. So, so when we... Huh. Oh, so, so he wants to throw some spiritual amnesia on you. Right. Mm -hmm. So you forget who you are. Yep. Blind you. And, and that's why your spiritual armor is, I ain't forget, I know who I am. I know who my daddy is. You can't take that from me, devil. You try, you try and accuse me of sins that were paid for. So when we put the whole armor of God, we were secure in Christ, huh. then our prayers are going to be different than what they were before. Yeah, let me then ask you this. going to be uh, praying in the spirit. And, and I say this because I went to uh, I've been going for walks lately, and uh, and my prayers are different than they were before. You know, I said, I know you love me. Mm. You know, um, I'm, I'm struggling with this or whatever, and, and I talk to him like I'm talking to somebody, right? But, you know, I, he knows me, and, and, and my prayers used to be like, oh, I'm sorry, like every little oh. thing I was yeah. trying to, you know. Both hands go up on that one. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I found freedom. The Bible says you know the truth and the truth should set you free. Free from what? Wrath. Anger. Mad at you. Don't want to fellowship with you. Free from all that. Yeah. You know, and what that does, you think that's going to make me want to sin. No, you know what? I've broken free from so much sin, it's not funny. And you know, and I'm pumped about my Lord. You know, I fall in love with, I'm, I, man, I spent three hours on a hike yesterday with just me and just the Lord and myself. Amen. And I do that, I make it a point to do that every day. Amen. Every day I go a couple of hours before I go to work. I can make twice as much money as my work as I do right now. You know what? I make twice as much money. They told me if I want to start in the morning, that's when all the road shows are because I drive a limousine and road shows are where you get bankers and you just drive them all day long to all their meetings. You pick them up at the hotel, pick them up at the airport, then you take them to this meeting, that meeting, that meeting, and then you take them to dinner and then you're done with them. And I'm just getting paid, you know, 30 bucks an hour all day long starting from in the morning. And that's good money all day long. Those are the, those are the jobs you want. Road shows worth back to back as opposed to airport where I go pick up somebody at the airport, take them to the house, and there's dead time where I'm only not making gratuity. You make gratuity when you have the guests in the car. But when you're in the dead time, two hours in between the run, you're, not, you're only making the hourly, not the gratuity. Mm -hmm. So you make twice as much with a guest in the car. And when, you have, when you're taking them all day long, you're making twice as much money as normal would. So those are the jobs you want. They told me, Henry, you're a senior driver. You could make twice what you're making now if you want to work in the morning. Wow. And, and I don't want to. You know why? Because I like going on my hikes and spending time with the Lord before I even start my day. Yeah. I sacrifice the money for the time with God. And you know what? All my needs are met. I have more than enough. I'm provided for. I don't, I, not, money's a non-issue. I have job security. You know, and God has placed me. Look in the church. I have a Bible study I'm leading. I have a jail ministry I'm doing on Mondays. God is providing every need, but what doing, taking, putting him first is what gives me the ability to do what I'm doing, you know, to be able to really trust him, 
you know, in those areas where, you know, and is there sin in my life? Absolutely there's sin in my life. But what am I going to do? What am I going to do when I sin? Praise God. What am I going to do when I sin? Amen. Huh? Beat myself up over it? Feel that God don't want to talk to me? Put him on a shelf for a few days because after all, I feel so dirty? That's what the devil wants. Right, right. He's not, the, the devil, devil, so devil wants... The God don't want you to waste a minute of your day, of your life. It's too short. Don't put me on the shelf at all. Don't think I don't want to talk to you. It's you thinking you thinking I can't talk to you that I don't want nothing to do with you. That's you thinking that. Don't go there. That's the devil he's lying to you. That's your own heart that's condemning you. And the Bible says if your heart condemns you, he's bigger than your heart. That's what the Bible says. Oh, come on. And that keeps you... Going forward, it can, Paul said, this one thing I do, I forget what is behind, I press on to the goal. Forget it. Did it. Done it. Dirty. I, but you know what? You own up to it, but you, you can own up to it if you, you feel pressured to talk to God about it. No problem with that. You, I'm not saying it's wrong to ever confess your sins. I'm not saying that. But I'll tell you right now, you don't need to confess every sin. You, God don't want you to be sin conscious, you know, by focusing on, on every mistake you make. No, he wants you to move forward and say, that ain't even me. That ain't even how I roll. What am I doing? And keep more move forward. Eyes over here. Eyes on me. Be led by the Spirit, not led by your junk. Oh, Amen. it's two different worlds. And people are living here thinking that that's what we got to do. We got to confess every sin, and we got to feel really convicted, and I got to repent and feel real sorry. And dude, right. what? I've been there, and I've been here, and I've seen what really works. Yeah. And I'll tell you, that didn't work for me. This does. That, that keeps you in defeat, lacking victory, feeling that God don't want to talk to you, feeling that, or at least feeling I can't talk to him, huh, which is, they're both the same thing. If you think God don't want to talk to you or I can't talk to him, well, say, that's the devil once you're there. One is right. the devil. Let's nip that in the bud and say, I ain't going there. Right. God's provided a way for me to approach him boldly. Yeah. I can come boldly to the throne of grace. And receive mercy and grace anytime I sin. Yes. Anytime you need it, it says. That means when I sin. What do I need mercy and grace for if I'm not sinning? He said, you can come boldly to the throne of grace and receive mercy and grace when you need it. That means when you sin. Oh. Don't the devil. Dude. You were gonna say Does that make sense? Though? I mean, that, that's heavy. That's heavy, but it keeps you moving forward. It keeps your eyes ahead. It keeps your eye out of the rearview mirror. If I'm driving my car and I'm looking in the rearview mirror, huh, I'm going to crash. Yeah. I used to do that. I used to do drugs. I used to get so spun out on my mind on drugs. You get this paranoia and you're all scared. Are cops? Is that the cops? Are they cops? And I'm watching the rearview mirror. And a cop could get behind me and I'm going to get pulled over just because I'm watching him more than I'm watching the road. He's going to pull me over. See, see the thinking? And that's how we are. We that's think weird when we think like that. We're going to crash. We're going to get busted. You're going to mess up because you're focusing behind you when you should be looking ahead. Yeah. Amen. Are, are you feeling me? Yeah. 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 That's where you crash. That's where you know victory. That's where like, like boo, a time to get pulled over because after all, I'm not looking forward. Huh. Why don't you look forward? You don't have to worry about devil pulling you over. Oh, when you focus right. on the way to drive your fast enough, you're focusing so much on what they're doing, you're not focusing on what you're supposed to do. Yeah. There you go. That's a great analogy, too. Yeah. Great. And we do that, too. And, and here's the thing, because Jesus taught, he said, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor the way you love yourself. That's three loves right there. You know that? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor the way you love yourself. That's three loves. So right there, it's telling you, you got to love yourself. Huh. What a blessing, huh? Uh, am I loving myself when I'm, hating on, uh, when I'm hating myself because after all, I sin and I'm feeling dirty and I don't even like myself? Well, how are you going to love somebody else right. if you're hating on yourself? Yeah. I mean, uh, come on. And, so, and, we're, and that, that was still the law. Love God with everything you got. How many do that? Nobody. Nobody loves God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, everything you got. We don't. We put other things before God. The Bible even says that. Paul said that. He says, we, we don't even seek after God. We, we, nobody does that. You know, so that's failure. That's law. So he said that's that love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor the way you love yourself. And this is all the law and the prophets all wrapped up in those two. That was all still law. So Jesus, we're focused on the big 10 or we're focused on those two. And Jesus says, just focus on this one. This new commandment I'm giving you. Love one another as I have loved you. And see, that's three loves too. Love one another 
as I, that's God's love for you, as I have loved you. That's all he wants. He just wants you now as a new covenant believer to focus on his love for you and then spread that love around. So right there tells you that I need to focus on his forgiveness for me so that I can forgive others. It is not Jesus before the cross saying, if you don't forgive men their sins, your heavenly father won't forgive you. It is now after the cross, it says to forgive one another as Christ in, God in Christ has forgiven you. So see, I got to be a recipient of his love. I got to be a recipient of his forgiveness to even give it out. You can't give what you don't have. So we are recipients. That's it. That's why the Bible says you just believe in his love. You just believe in his forgiveness. You believe in his blood did the work. You believe in the finished work of the cross. You just believe in that stuff. And I will capture your heart through your faith. Amen. 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 Excellent. Yeah. Isn't it good? Watch this. Jesus infuriated the religious leaders by this very fact. He forgave sins of which he was not even the victim. He, how could he, as a third party, forgive one person's transgression about, uh, against another? How could Jesus, if, if I said to you, your sins are forgiven, how could I say your sins are forgiven when you didn't sin against me? If your sin is against God, how could I forgive you of sins that aren't even against me? Huh? Yeah. The only way I can forgive you of some, a sin against God is if, it, if I'm God. I, I, are, you, are you feeling me? I mean, because I can't, if you sin against Hovita, and I say, you know what, I forgive you what you did against Hovita. I forgive you for that. I'm, does, does that have any effect? She's got to forgive no. you. Yes, right. It's got to come from her. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I can forgive you all day long, but that doesn't change anything with your relationship with her. Exactly. Yeah. It's got to come from her. Yeah. And that's how it is with Jesus. Jesus went around forgiving people for sins against God, and the only way he could do that is if he was God. Amen. Sins against Lord. himself, yeah. 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 Okay, so how could you, okay, he can do this because he's God, because he is pure, because he chooses, here it goes, because he chooses to be a third party to every wrong act we ever commit. Do you hear this? He chooses to be a third party in every wrong act we commit. Christ removes not only the penalty, here it goes, not only the penalty for your sin, but he cleanses us completely from its slightest taint. Anything, any mark of sin on you, he cleanses you of all that. And you and I can stand before God as if we lived a life of utter purity and perfection. You can stand before God as if you've lived a pure, holy, complete life from day one, from very birth unto eternity. Never sinning. Never sinning. Oh. Deep, huh? Yeah. Very deep. Yeah. It, it is deep. Yeah. But go to, go to Hebrews 7.25 and look what this This is an eternal, eternal security scripture. Well, how many want to see a scripture? It's, just, it's very clear. It's eternal security. Want to feel secure in Christ? Anybody want that? Yes. yes. Always. So Hebrews uh, 7. 7.25. Thank you. 7.25. We'll start at 19. Okay. When everybody has to say amen. 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 For the law made nothing perfect. Why didn't the law make anybody perfect? Because it has no power to make anyone righteous. Yeah. It just, it just, it just shows you your unrighteousness. Your unrighteousness. Yeah. It, shows it shows you where you mess up, yeah, where you miss it. It increases law. The law lawlessness. says, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. It doesn't give you it's just showing you where you're messing up. Yeah. It doesn't give you a compliment and say, hey, Eric, you're doing pretty good, buddy. <laughs> huh? Keeping all these laws? Hmm. Good job, buddy. <laughs> no, it's just going to show you you're missing it. Yeah. A cop won't pull you over and say you're a good driver. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the last time we got pulled over by a cop and he says, hey, you're driving really good today. You know, the law doesn't do that. The law pulls you over for, 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 for driving careless and yeah. for me messing up. Running a red light. That's what the law yeah. does. Yeah. That's a good point. That's yeah. what, a cop who represents the law, that's what he's going to pull you over for doing wrong. That's what the law does. Now look, for made nothing perfect, on the other hand, okay, here it goes, two sides of the street. On the other hand, there is the bringing of a better hope. Who is that? Jesus. It's a person. A better hope through which we draw near to God. Who do we, how do we draw near to God? Didn't he say, I am the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father except right. by me. So who is that hope that we draw through near? Right? Jesus. Okay? 
Yep. Then it goes on talking about, um, uh, let's jump to 24. What, uh, what uh, a version of the Bible are you reading? A New King James. New King James. I like the New King James. Is that Romans 7, 25? No, no Hebrews. 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 Oh. Hebrews. So now you have to 24? Yeah, we're going 